Good evening. Okay, that was good. We can do a little better. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. I'm Bridget Blanton. I have the privilege of being the director of the Greensboro Public Library, actually the City of Greensboro Department of Libraries and Museum. Welcome this evening. So, um, Beth Sheffield, who is our adult programming coordinator, and I are kind of at this place now. So I'm going to give Beth a shout out right now ahead of time. So Beth, the person you see running around with a little green shell on, that's Beth, and she's the person that helps make this happen for us. And so thank you, Beth, publicly for all that you do. Our philosophy now has become plan it and they will come, right? So I do want to welcome you on behalf of the City of Greensboro's Department of Libraries and Museum and the Greensboro Public Library Foundation, who without the foundation, we would not be able to ho have these events because they actually, believe it or not, um, they are the people who pay for it. The city of Greensboro pays for us as staff and our facilities, but all these great programs that we bring to you would not happen, could not happen without the Greensboro Public Library Foundation. So, <laughs> One City, One Book has been actually happening in Greensboro since 2002, and I'm gonna call him out because he doesn't know that I see him, but under the great leadership of Steve Summerford, who was our assistant director, who had a vision and worked with Sandy. So people wondered when Steve retired, would it die? We don't let legacies die. We just carry them on and try to honor the people. So Steve, to you, thank you for having the vision. So I know that you all know that um, I always like to put my own little spin on something and then I think I freaked the community out this year because we started when I became director putting a public vote out there for the project and suddenly this year there was no public vote. So I'm gonna explain that real quickly. We came out of COVID and one of the things that people were saying to us, we actually, this book was still selected based on the fact of community input. But when we got down to the last five or six titles, they were all kind of depressing. And folks told us, we don't want any more sadness. We want to be able to talk. And so uh, Beth and I had a conversation in the back room, talked to Andrew Spainauer there, who's the chair of our board of trust, uh, excuse me, board of the foundation. And we said, there's this book that made the top called Car at the Carolina Table. And you know, we are Southerners, at least most of us, and we love food and we love to talk about food and we love to talk about culture. What happens if we select a book that's based on um, local authors, North Carolina authors, you know, edited by Randall Keenan, honoring him, and what if we do that? And not only what if we do that, what if we do it and we have one of the longest One City, One Books we've had? So we're not just programming for you tonight and a couple of weeks ago, we're gonna be programming probably through the month of May based on this book. So we're excited about that. So if you have friends, tell them to pay attention because when I tell you we don't just have big names now, we've got big names coming. So I wanna specifically again give um, honor and a shout out to the Greensboro Public Library Foundation um, Penguin Random House Publishing, um, Quaintance Weaver Restaurants and Hotels who have sponsored this event. And then in your program, you'll see a list of the community sponsors and community partners. So thank you all for your continued support, your continued faith in what libraries do to change lives because our tagline at the Greensboro Public Library is libraries are a conduit to destiny. And so right now I have the privilege of turning this evening over to my friend, to my colleague, uh, the city of Greensboro's chief equity, diversity and inclusion officer, Maria Hicks Few. She is going to work with these authors tonight to have a great time. So I turn it over to Maria without further ado. Thank you, Bridget, thank you. And welcome everyone. You all look so beautiful out there. Yes, welcome, welcome. Well, tonight we are going to have a down-home conversation with these authors. And we wanna to get to know them a little bit better, but we also want to know, you know, a few quirky things about them. Don't we wanna know some secrets? Yes, yes. We wanna have a little talk a little chit chat and then in the end we're going to save time for questions if i don't cover them all we're going to save time at the end for you all so without further ado i'm going to introduce first miss sandra gutierrez <laughs> sandra is celebrating her new book and i love to say this latinissimo an encyclopedic book, cookbook, celebrating Latin American home cooking. She is a journalist, food writer, as well as a historian, professional cooking instructor, and also the author of four cookbooks. And she also knows how to wear the color green very well. <laughs> 
Our next panelist is Ms. Carla Hall, everyone. <laughs> Carla has entertained audiences with her quick wit, culinary knowledge, as well as her charisma since her debut on Top Shelf with Chef, which I know we all watched that season, didn't we? Yes, yes. Carla strives to communicate that food is love and is proud to share soul food recipes inspired by her southern roots. Welcome, welcome. We next have Nancy McDermott. And my friend Nancy has written on food and travel for Bon Appetit, food and wine. Oh my goodness. Fine cooking, Cooks Illustrated, and Every Day with Rachel Ray. She also plays the role of cake historian on Alton Brown's Good Eats. Let's welcome Nancy. And last but certainly not least, I was so thrilled to meet her, Fran McCullough. Fran is the author of the Low Carb Cookbook as well as Living Low Carb. She won a James Beard Award for Great Food Without Fuss. And since 1999, she's been the editor of the annual best-selling The 150 Best American Recipes Anthology Series. Welcome, Miss Fran. Welcome. So they've already loosened up, y'all, because they've been here. Not all with day. drink. You have to qualify. I mean, we were not in back there drinking. Come, I didn't mean that loose, Carla. Okay, but you've loosened up. So they already are chummy. They already um, know what the assignment is tonight. So we're gonna get down and dirty and get down to it. So the first question, and Miss Fran, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your first experience in the kitchen. First experience in the kitchen, I remember I was on the island of Saipan in the Marianas Islands after the war. This is old times, people. Whoa. And we didn't have anything to eat much. We had liverwurst, which I was passionate about. And I remember making myself a sandwich out of Wonder Bread, lettuce, mayonnaise, and peanut butter, and thinking, oh my God, that's really good. <laughs> I want to learn to make more good things. Absolutely. <laughs> I could have it with my canned cocoa malt, which was how we got milk. We didn't have fresh eggs, milk, anything. We had fish, but my father didn't like fish. So. Okay. so I was ready for food when I got back to the States and landed in <laughs> Iowa. Lucky wow. me. Wow. Well, that sounded interesting and you had me until the peanut butter. But the lettuce. <laughs> but it was lettuce and peanut butter. Lettuce and peanut what butter. Did you hear lettuce? Did you say that? Lettuce. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why. Do we you still do, do you eat that now? I do, yeah. Oh, so I it was want on my sandwich. We're gonna all go home and try that. Who's gonna try it? <laughs> okay, one person. Okay, no, I'm maybe, two. Like maybe two. Maybe two. Maybe two. Sell it, Fran. Sell it. Right? Yeah. A bit. No, that's a PLT. That's it's a peanut a PLT, butter. Wait. <laughs> but you got the lettuce in there. Oh. Okay. Yeah. yeah you okay. Got the lettuce in there. I like it. All right. Uh, so, Carla, since you jumped in and said you would eat it, right? She'll try exactly. It. No, Carla said she'd eat it. No, I know I everybody I heard said, that. I said I uh -huh. would eat it. I want to because. Let me tell you what else there was to uh -oh. eat. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> you would eat it. <laughs> yeah. No. Correct. I I I would eat it. I'm gonna try lettuce and peanut butter on wonder okay let me know about that later okay okay all right okay <laughs> so tell us about your first experience cooking cooking yes so i don't think i think um i wasn't one i wasn't a cooker when i was a kid a lot of people are surprised uh by that i wasn't next to my mom or grandmother or dad cooking i cooked with a purpose the purpose was a badge for girl scouts and um we remember those days yeah and i i made a an apple brown betty 
And I feel like spaghetti somehow. I'm sure it was with a jar. And I, my mother was the Girl Scout leader. I put this whole thing together. It felt like it took forever. It felt like it took days, but I'm sure it wasn't days. It just felt like that. And then um, I invited a young lady who was on my street, and I went to ask her grandmother if she wanted to come and eat something that I made. I was getting a Girl Scout badge for it. And I go, and she said, well, she can go if, you, if her hair is combed. <laughs> so I had to comb her hair. Okay. And uh, okay. I get home, and the dish that I had made was gone. No. What? So I made it, but I don't know what it tasted like. Well, did you have any comments of how it tasted? I heard it was good. Okay. And how did the hair turn out? Her oh. hair was great. Okay, good. Was so it was a good day. <laughs> it was a good day. Okay. It was a good day. It was, it was, a, good day. Day. It was, it was a good day. It was a good day. So that was the first thing that I made, you know, okay. and I didn't cook again until I was 20 something. No, I was... Oh. Yeah. No, but yeah. But that went well when you, when you did come back to it. It's gone pretty well. I, uh, yeah. So, yeah. You know, it, yeah. And yeah. what did her hair look like during all those years? <laughs> <laughs> you see, I we know, love the details. As you can see, I'm bringing, bringing the fashion, the hair, and the food all together. You that's, know, it. Yeah. that's it. That's it. That's it. All right. Well, who would like to go? To My green sister. What was your first experience like cooking? My first ex experience cooking, before Martha Stewart was born, there was my grandmother. Oh, okay. that's good. <laughs> and she was a socialite in Guatemala, and she had parties and reunions in her house every weekend, and all of her grandchildren had to go into the room, whether there were 10 people there or 40 people there, and kiss everybody on the cheek and say, hello, nice to meet you, wow. and then stay for a little bit. I wouldn't stay. I was very shy. I would kiss everybody hello and run out and hide in the kitchen. And her staff, she had a cooking staff, uh, would tell me that I couldn't stay there unless I did something. So I started cooking when I was five and six years old. Oh, wow. In the kitchen. The first, my first assignment was to take off the little pieces of stone in the beans and clean the beans. And then I graduated to making miniature tortillas, because of course my hands were really little, so that they could serve miniature little tortillas for appetizers. <laughs> And so on and so forth. And I ended up, I, I cooked there until I was in my 20s. So almost every weekend I had cooking classes and I didn't even know it. That's and you wrote amazing. a book on beans. I, yeah, I did. No, I was going to say, yeah. So beans are out there. Yes, Carl. So no, I want to ask you, so when you were picking the beans, what was your technique of getting the stones out of the beans? Okay, you would put some beans on a plate usually a white plate, and then would just move some beans around and you would find the pebbles and throw them out from one side of the plate. I still do that when I, you know... Yeah, I kind of do that too. Yeah. I do it on a sheet pan. Oh, there so, you go. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like well, it. If it ain't broke, a, don't fix it. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, some things we can update and use a food processor and get fancy, but that's the way to pick beans. That is the way to <laughs> pick beans. How far back does that go Absolutely. beyond your grandmother? But I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I still, and my mom's back over here, but I just remember being in the kitchen with my mom and my grandma cooking collard, y'all. I'm an Aggie, so around Auntie's homecoming time, y'all, and in that sink and just making sure your hands were in it and you got everything clean and, and you sorted it. So I can only imagine, I was just going to ask, did you carry that down with your family members? Did anyone at five, your daughter, granddaughter, whomever, um, actually learn that technique and practice that technique? No, they didn't. They did oh. something worse. Oh. They, I was... I had had surgery and my girls must have been eight and nine years old and they had the brilliant idea of going to go get one of their American Girl cookbooks and there was a recipe there. Oh my gosh, what was the name of it? I don't remember. It's just like cornstarch water and red food coloring and sugar. Oh no. And you know when you're taking all these medicines and you're all loopy and not feeling very well and you said go ahead, didn't you? They gave it to me and yeah. I, I had to eat it and I will never forget it. So no, I didn't encourage a lot of those experiments. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, that's fair enough, that's fair enough. Now I wonder, was that better than Fran's peanut butter and lettuce? I assure you it was not. <laughs> okay, okay, I was just saying. I'm voting for Fran's. I know, me too, me too. And speaking of your first cooking experience. So I, I thought, oh, I don't remember, and then I immediately remembered. Um, my mother had, uh, in the pantry, instant rice, 
and I love the book, The Pokey Little Puppy. Any baby boomers out here, the little golden readers? Thank you, thank you. We can still clap, see, we're good. So there's a little puppy and he's naughty and the punishment is when he comes home late from not doing what he was supposed to do, he didn't get the dessert, which was rice pudding. And my mother was born and raised on North Carolina dairy farm and did not know from rice pudding, so I've never had it, but I wanted to have it. And sometime probably around eight or nine, the rice box of instant rice um, had a rice pudding recipe on the back. So I followed it and made it, and I loved it. I mean, there's better rice pudding in the world, but I wanted something, I made it, and it worked out. And here I stand today, or sit. <laughs> but it was a positive, it was something that I wanted, it was aspirational, like, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and people worry about it. It's like, oh, well, I did this, but I used instant rice, I cheated. It's like, it's fine. I made I made cakes with cake mix long before I wrote a book about cakes. Absolutely. So it's it's like it's not it wasn't with my grandmother. I watched her make biscuits, but I didn't pay attention. <laughs> I was six. I just wanted to go out and get the eggs from under the hens. So so you make me feel better. It's okay to improvise. Can uh, we say that? Yes. Oh. It's okay yes. to improvise. It's Always. okay to improvise. Okay. <laughs> Who's going to get the t-shirt made first? It's okay to improvise. Okay. So with that being said, what inspired you? Let's start here, Miss Sandra. What inspired you to actually write your cookbook? And did you improvise? This last cookbook, um, what inspired me was the desire to break the stereotypes that tied Latin American mm. together and that have segregated Latin yes. American food in the world. Yes. That was the desire. But did I have to improvise? When I started recipe testing, I was supposed to go to, uh, to a 23 city trip with my husband. Mm -hmm. And the week before, COVID hit and the world shut down. Oh, wow. And so what was I going to do with all those people that I wanted to meet and I wanted to interview and everything? A friend of mine from Panama called and said, Sandra, I have this chef who's going nuts. He's driving everybody nuts because his restaurant's closed and he needs to do something. And I said, does he know how to make a sancocho? Yes, let's do this for him. Let's organize a cooking class and you can interview everybody who comes to the class wow. about that dish. And that became my formula for Wow. About 500 recipes. That's brilliant. I was able to interview um, different cooks with one dish and say, how do you make it different? How did your mother make it? How did your grandmother make it? What things are in common? And from all of those things, develop a recipe that, and then many of them tasted it to tell me whether it, it was what they remembered. That's amazing. Okay, now you have me intrigued. Okay, con, con, say it again. Con Sancocho. 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 Okay. Sancocho what, de what Domingo. Is that? that is a chicken soup from Panama. Um, the word Sancocho means to boil. So we, we use it in different countries. Got but it. in Panama, it is a dish. It's a, a chicken soup, usually made on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very simple. It's uh, onion, garlic, oil, and a little bit of culantro, which is the long leaf sawtooth yes. cilantro. It's much stronger. And it doesn't turn black when you cook it. It stays oh. green. And then you put your chicken in there, let it sweat for about a while, and then add water and let it cook. That's it. And then they add, um, most of them add nyame, which is the original yam from oh, Africa. Yes. Yes. Yam. Okay. Say it again. Yame. 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 I never yeah. have heard it said. Heard and it. you can get it here in the States. Where? Frozen and cut into pieces in your freezer section of most supermarkets. Goya does it, La Fe does it, several people do it. So, yummy. Compare foods. Really, we have it. Yeah, we have compare. Really? Compare okay. foods. That's, that was my store when I was writing the book. Um, but the, the thing about yummy is that it depends on how the grandmothers put it in the soup, how thick the soup became. So, some grandmothers would shred it into the pot and it would dissolve and become a creamy chowder, while others would chop it and add it just at the end and have chunky soup. So those are all the variations that I share with you with every recipe. I try to share those variations. Wow. What does it taste like, Sandra? It tastes, it's, it's a mixture, I'm gonna say, between a squash and a potato, but it is softer. So Ooh. it's, it's more delicate than a sweet potato. Uh -huh. It doesn't get fluffy. It, it actually gets... It's like watery. Like watery. Yeah. It's delicious. Yeah. Wow. And creaminess. That's yeah. wonderful. I, I did not know that. Uh, <laughs> me neither. <laughs> I know. So everybody learned something today. <laughs> I mean... 
I'm, I'm, you've made me hungrier. You know that, right? It's going to keep going and going and going. So, okay, Fran, what would you yes. say um, inspired you as far as writing and everything you've done over the years? We're just in awe of everything that you've done. What truly inspired you? Well, unlike everybody else Absolutely. on the stage, I'm not a famous chef or cook. Mm -hmm. I'm an editor. <laughs> and I've edited a lot of cookbooks, yes. which I loved working mm -hmm. on. I love my authors. I love the books they write. I fought hard for them. Um, when I came to write cookbooks myself, it was because I needed them. I needed to know something. Uh, the low-carb cookbooks, the second generation of low-carb eating had just begun. I'm somebody who doesn't process carbs well. I always have a problem with them. I always want to eat them. And I thought, I need to find some simple, delicious, foods that I can eat on a regular basis that aren't weird, that aren't full of weird chemicals and, you know, Absolutely. odd things that nobody would ever have in their kitchen. I don't want to eat like that. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of research and ended up publishing a best-selling cookbook, which was very As exciting. As you do. Yes, you okay. did. Yes. <laughs> and yes. a follow-up yes. cookbook, which is very <laughs> exciting. And the next thing I did, I thought, what if all these people saying you shouldn't eat low carb because it's so high fat and fat is really terrible for you and now you're going to die. What if they're right? I don't know that they're not right. All these doctors I've consulted tell me, no, it's, that's not true. Mm. So I wrote a book about fats called Good Fat, which explored how to incorporate good fats into your diet, which is basically all the fats these wonderful grandmothers have been cooking with forever. For years. Any natural fat in its natural state is good for you. And every culture down history has highly honored fats in the diet and recognized they're very important. So that was extremely exciting to go talk to scientists and people who were actually working in this area who said, no, 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 all this stuff, cholesterol, uh, no. It was great and it was ahead of its time, so it's Absolutely. not still in print. But it's still accurate. The science hasn't really changed a lot. And then I was asked to do a series, Best American Recipes, which was because we all have gluts of recipes in our lives. But we, what we really want to know is, what are the keepers? What are the great recipes that really deliver on taste and interest and comfort and all those things we like that don't take forever to cook and you don't have to buy a million weird ingredients at right. the store to do them. Worth the time they take. Yeah. The time it is. So I started on that project. That was part of the Best American Short Stories, Best American yes. Essays, mm -hmm. etc. And it nearly drove me crazy. I had a helper at one point because we were looking at the back of the box recipes, the recipes we found on social media, every cookbook that was published, every food magazine, after every food section, foodie groups. But it was fabulous. I loved doing it. It was really, really hard. So I did that for seven years. Were those and healthy recipes as well? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make yeah. sure everybody knew those were healthy recipes. They were. But what I find is so interesting, Fran, is as an editor, and you're inspired by a hole in the market, that as somebody who is doing cookbooks, our inspiration may come from somewhere else, but you know where that hole is. And yes. you have filled that hole, and you've gone right to it and, and done a bestseller. 
and and we don't really have the benefit of that. We don't know how to do that. We we just do a book and we hope it pray it's going to be good. Right. <laughs> and that takes wisdom. And when I heard you talking, all I could think about was what a skill that was to think of something and say, "Wow, let me get the research behind it. Let me put it together and put that out there for other people." So I know when we talked, because she's so humble. I love Fran. Fran emailed me and said, <laughs> "Now Maria." When you get to asking certain questions, I'm a little different, but I think it's not different, it's unique. Because I see you as kind of the, the trailblazer for all of this because you put the things together to make things flow because of the data and because of the research. And for me, that's so amazing. So we thank you, we uh, thank you, Fran. Well, we thank you. Great. We and if we you. didn't have editors, we would. She was uh, her own editor. Yeah. What kind of stuff is that? I, we know well, what, you don't have to pay anybody. She's both the whole I mean, package. Yes. I have always said editors save us from ourselves. Yes. And so Absolutely. to have an editor here sitting with us, somebody who's edited the top authors this country has seen Absolutely. this few years, is, is an honor, but it's also a great way for you all to get a full picture of what cookbook writing is like yes. and what the production of cookbooks is because it's not as easy as most people think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Carla, what about you? What was the inspiration? So my inspiration uh, comes from, I, at heart, I love to teach. Like, so I, I love to teach cooking classes. And when I did my first cookbook, I felt like somebody said, oh, I feel like it's time for you to do a cookbook. And I'm like, wait, what am I going to say? And, and and it ended up being a journal of my, like growing up in Tennessee and then doing Top Chef and then being a caterer. But I, I felt disconnected from the experience. I felt like it was, I had to hurry up and, and have some connection to this book. And, you know, and, and so I was constantly looking for a personal connection um, that I could sink my teeth into. And so for my second cookbook, and it was a two cookbook deal, so I'm like, oh my God, you know, like, oh my God, go, be fabulous. And I'm like, ah, um, I mean, it's so much pressure, right? I mean, it's a yes. lot of pressure, right? True. It's like, oh my God, who, 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 who saw this deal? Yeah. Like, I'm gonna do two cookbooks. Um, I'm a genius. I'm an idiot. I'm a genius. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm like, what exactly? Just sell it. It's like, I can do this. I'm the only one who can do it. And then it's like, oh no. What I have I oh. done? And, no, it was yes, all of that. I know. And so I remember it was in 2007. And I remember thinking, um, like, how people were criticizing, uh, they were just criticizing people. And, and it's whatever I needed to hear, I heard. And, um, they and didn't I criticize you. No, 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 not me. I was getting ready to say okay, no. Girl, we'll I know you got my that. back. Y'all see I that? I have <laughs> your back. Okay. All right. No, but it was, it was like, it, it was, it was during um, an election year and how everybody starts nabbing at everybody, you know, and just basically talking about like, like all your faults and flaws and everything. And then um, I remember somebody um, had criticized me, like it's something about my nose or something on the, on, the, on the chew, whatever. But I was like, wait a minute. And it just popped into my head. Everybody has a nose, but everybody's nose is different. And then I, I went to like, wait, everybody eats rice. Everybody's rice is different. We may criticize people about like different things, or, but we tend to not criticize a culture for their dish. Ooh, so, and that was good. my inspiration. Yes. So I'm like, oh my gosh, so how does this, how does this culture eat this? And how does, you know, because everybody has a smothered chicken dish, but is it paprikash? Is it, is it um, mm. like, is it um, like, milk gravy is it uh, a, a french wine sauce you know what i mean mm -hmm. everybody has one but it's different and we tend to not criticize and that's when i came to food is a place where we can stand on our own and be okay with wherever wow. and whoever we are wow. and that was my inspiration for my second cookbook and then i continued that for my third 
And I think, and do you think, oh, go ahead, clap. I heard a clap. Yay. <laughs> okay, clap. Yes. But do you think that comes from the root of where they always say food is comfort? Yeah. Because what you just said felt like it was comforting. Yes. And it brought you comfort because the pressure of the industry to say, do this, do this. But you were at comfort and at peace during that second book. That's what I thought I heard you say. That is exactly okay, it. And okay. I felt more, I felt more connected to that book and I felt more mm. connected to different cultures. So if you see spinach, I'm like, okay, how do I eat spinach? I do cream spinach, but how, how would they do spinach in India? How would they do spinach in another country like Absolutely. Greece or wherever, right? Absolutely. So it became this bigger table and also a table of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And that's what I saw was missing. It's always missing in the political arena. I mean, you know, everybody wants to talk about people's differences, but how could I talk about the similarities in food? Absolutely. Yeah. And food brings people together. Yeah. How many foodies do we have in here? Every hand should go up. That's right. We are foodies. It's a cold night in October. Yes, it they, is. It's a chilly night. I am so wanting chili right now for some reason. <laughs> mm, I'm making myself hungrier. Okay, Nancy, what do you think about your inspiration? Tell us about your inspiration. Well, I've always loved to cook. I mean, I, like I, you know, that, that rice pudding, I was eight or nine, and then I got my mother's cookbooks. My mother did not like to cook very much. It was one of her jobs, and so my first um, adventure in cooking was making dessert for bridge parties. We were Baptists, so they would okay. had a couples bridge club every <laughs> okay. eighth week. It was at our house, and she had to do something, and I started catering the desserts wow. for my mother's bridge club, couples bridge club, my parents' bridge club. And that was fun, and it was rewarding, but I never thought about it as something that I would do mm -hmm. for work. I just love to cook, I love to eat. I wanted to see the world, and was just very curious from books in the library, and I went to, I joined the Peace Corps and was sent to Thailand. Now, when I said Thailand, no one said, oh my God, I love Thai food at that time among my American friends. Right. It was, uh, is that near Vietnam? This was 1975 to 1978 is when I was there. So I went to Thailand with no sense of food, but it was, the food was wonderful and I fell in love with it, but I stayed three years without a thought about how I would continue to have Thai food in my life when, as I planned to, I went home. And so I came back to Greensboro, North Carolina and moved into Lindley Park Manor oh. and got my teaching certificate because I had taught English as a second language mm -hmm. and looked around and thought, how do I get Thai food? Because there were a few Chinese restaurants. Uh, there was there one were no the Oriental Thai. Market. That's You're oh, right, oh, no, no none. Thai. Um, and so I had brought a few cookbooks home and I started cooking Thai food just because I missed it. I went to the Oriental Market, which was on Spring Garden mm -hmm. and Wendover, that intersection of just this little brick building. They had jasmine rice, and, and you could have used minute rice, but they did have jasmine rice, which is wonderful. It's aromatic, it's got a nutty aroma. It's a long green rice. Um, they had coconut milk in a can. They had red curry paste. They had galanga, which is a cousin of ginger. It looks yes. like wood chips. Mm -hmm. You know, they had the preserved one, not fresh. It was a Korean store. It was Korean, mm -hmm. it's called the Oriental Market. And that galanga, and, the, and then I needed lime juice. I, they had fish sauce. So these, you know, all these shelf stable things that they had as an Oriental Market. And I went home and I took one of my books and I made Tonkagai, which is chicken coconut soup. Oh. And it was delicious. Mm. It was just <laughs> like bet. Thailand. Yes. And therefore I thought maybe I could make yum guy and maybe I could make something else and maybe I could make a curry and I could. And I just continued to cook for my own pleasure. Moved to New York, had more ingredients, got married, moved to um, uh, Los Angeles for mm -hmm. my husband's work. He's a scientist. Mm -hmm. And we were in Irvine. And I had started doing a little writing, and I wanted. I took a food writing class, and I thought, well, I'll write about Thai food. And of course, there I was in the Los Angeles suburbs. Little Saigon was mm -hmm. 20 minutes up the freeway with not just a little market, but gigantic Asian supermarkets that had all the fresh things that I remembered from the market. I had just like walked to the market and said, isn't this interesting? Let's go eat. <laughs> but now right? I want to make this, I want to make that, I want to make exactly. that. So just for my own pleasure, I'd learned to make it. Then I started to teach it and write it. So it was a way to have something in my life that I enjoyed. And then I moved back to North Carolina and got interested in 
the Southern cooking that I'd grown up with, I was born in Burlington, grew up in High Point. My grandmother had a dairy farm. And so I grew up on all that food and I really loved cakes. And so I was interested in coconut cake and all this. So I started writing about cakes and people said, wow, what? Oh, I've, and you did Thai food and now you, that, it's so different. And I thought, yeah, it's so different. How did I do that? And then I realized it's not different at all. I'm interested in home cooking Absolutely. and traditional cooking. And, and things that you can ask people about. I'm very interested in something that existed 50 years ago. I have no original ideas ever about some, if I go to a restaurant, it's like, wow, that's so cool. How'd you think of that? But, but that just, because I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a food detective. I'm Miss Frizzle on the Magic School Bus, only we're going on foodie field trips. Wow. But I will also oh, say God. about Nancy that she's an amazing writer. When you read Nancy's recipes, even if you didn't know who was right? You just you were just given the blind recipe without the book. You would know it's Nancy's voice, mm, it's her style, her style. We call mm -hmm. we I mean writing. We call it our voice. It's what we right, right. The right. way that you read it to yourself, how it sounds in your head, and her voice is instead of saying take a bowl and um, flour in a bowl, plop it in there and mix it. She'll say take a large bowl that feels comfortable in your hand and then take uh, gingerly put the flour in there. It's so beautiful to read. It's almost wow. like a poem. A lot of words. Editors yeah. come after me for word count. Your head note is two pages long. This is not going to happen. No, but it's beautiful. And I think that if you start looking at cookbooks and start finding those that have yeah. voices, Boys. then you're going to start finding a different connection with food. And I think we write with voices. And I, I think I love that you said that because also as a writer, um, and, and I, I wonder this about you, Nancy, have you looked at things that you wrote, I don't know, 40 years ago, and then you look at them like, you know, over the time and how your writing changed and how you really be, sort of figured out your style, you know? I think one thing that really helped me as a writer is that I had to teach cooking classes to actual human beings in a room who had signed up because they wanted to learn about Thai food. Yeah. They didn't sign up because of me. They wanted to learn about Thai food. And I went in and it's like, here's how you do this. And people say, wait, wait, w which thing is lemongrass? And I thought, oh, oh, how am I going to do this if they don't even, these idiots. But they had paid for the class. <laughs> <laughs> and there I was right in front of them. And so I had to stop and explain what lemongrass was and how you would find it in the store because it wasn't labeled or where you would find it. And so that made me decide, I really want to help people do this. So I guess I need to meet them where they are. And it made me realize, it's like somebody says, how do you get, how do you get to Okra Coke Island? And I'd say, well, are you in a hurry? Because if you're in a hurry, you're going to do this. But if you've got time, it would be so cool to do that. Absolutely. There's not one way to get to Okra Cook mm -hmm. Island. There's not one way to get to New York City. And so I started, you know, it just, it came from trying to tell how to do the food and the stories that came with it. Because if a recipe doesn't have any story behind it, right. I'm not interested. I don't want to make it. I, right. I don't want to do it. And I think right. we're all, we're all mm -hmm. the food and it the stories. Like and if I want to make chocolate chip cookies, I go to that internet and I put in chocolate chip cookies, chewy, because that's how I like them. And I get that because all I want to do that day, and, and this, that's not wrong. You might find my recipe. You probably won't. But if I want to know about a cuisine, if I go, if I travel and I come home, went to Oaxaca in January with my friend Bill Smith and fell in love with Oaxacan food and I came back and I wanted to make um, mole verde. And so I looked, I had Mexican cookbooks already. I looked online, I made a big folder and I ended up with Patty Hinich's Mole Verde. It had the so, picture, wow. it had the, um, the radishes sliced in oh. it. It had the white beans in it. And I said, okay, I'm gonna start with this one. Oh. And, and that one stop. because I wanted the story. Oh. And You're that's why we write, you. that's why we write recipes. Exactly. It, it's, it's this trying to share with you something that we are passionate about, right. but try to share it in a way in which you can be successful at making it too. Yes. And that is what we want. We, yes. we don't write these books in a vacuum just like to, right. for ourselves. It's, it's not uh, something that you just say, I, I want to do this for me, for my pleasure. No, we're thinking, who else would like to learn this? Who are they? And I think that's what teaching helps. We know yeah, exactly. our readers. Teaching. We yeah. know who you are. We know the amount of time you have when you get home after work, in the kind of recipes that you like with a certain number of ingredients and not any more, any less, the kinds of techniques that you prefer over others. We know that because we teach you, and we've been teaching for decades. So that's what makes our books different. 
So would you say that that is the rubric or the matrix or whatever you want to call it of what you decided to keep in the book and what you decided to take out of the book? If it didn't have that feeling or wasn't teachable, you, it didn't make the cut. Absolutely. Yeah. But also ah. when testers try them, the recipes. Uh, yeah, the testers. Did it speak to them as okay. much as it spoke to me? Okay, okay. Because then I have a higher probability that it will speak to you. Okay. And I think, I think also, to your point, um, you have to take the ego out of it. Because I, yeah. my, first book, my, my first book, um, Cooking with Love, the recipes are good. But I, I thought they had to be difficult because I needed to feel good about the, that book. Like, what am I going to say? Well, I'm going to make it hard because I just left Top Chef and it needs to be hard. And then somebody's like, what the heck? You know? And so then it becomes more about... Like if I was a teacher, it's like what I want to teach you, not what I know. That it, it doesn't matter about what I know. It's like what I want to teach you. And so it becomes very different. I even think about how many dishes you're gonna use. I think about your time in the dish sink. I think I, yes. I think about everything. I'm like, I'm gonna tell you to use a couple bowls. Tell it, Carl. If you don't need an extra bowl, I'm not gonna put in the recipe. I'm like, use that same bowl. Absolutely. <laughs> it's already got the good Absolutely. stuff in there. No. Do we even have to wipe it out or can we just dump everything well, in see, there? Well see, this is something that that, um, Jacques Pepin talks about it's like even in um, like when you use a food processor so he will have you put in breadcrumbs and you put the breadcrumbs and you're not gonna put any wet thing wet in the food processor right. first you put something dry so when you dump it out it doesn't matter and then the last thing is gonna be a wet thing yeah that like but you've used it three times yes. You know, and everything are, is adding up because it's all going in the dish. So yes. that's a, that's that's our gift. Exactly. Is exactly. this? We want you to have success. We want it to be delicious. And if and some things aren't for everybody to do, or there, or it's like I like them. I'm an oddball. <laughs> Lettuce and peanut butter. Everybody's not. Gonna, <laughs> that might not make it in a cookbook, but I might decide to make it. So it's gonna make. So that there's for all, all of these us. pieces that we put together to say what's gonna be in the book. That sounds good. Now, kind of transitioning, because I know we have to spend time um, with some questions from the audience, but if there are any aspiring authors out there, what would you all say as far as advice? Carla just gave some good sound advice, so I'll give you a moment um, you know, to kind of get another piece of advice together. But let's go back to Fran. Fran, what advice would you give any aspiring authors that may be in the audience that would like to write a cookbook? Well, oddly enough, <clears throat> I anticipated that question. No way, Fran. I did. The wisdom. <laughs> Wise, Fran. This yes. is the kind of thing you do when you're really old, you know? You are seasoned. <laughs> seasoned. Things just Vintage. in your head Vintage. and you think right. they're going to ask that question. Yes. So I called a friend of mine who's a very successful literary agent for cookbooks, among other things, this afternoon. And I said... I'm going to this do in Greensboro. I had no idea how wonderful it was going to be. I had no idea about your incredible library system and all wow. of this stuff. I'm so blown away by it. And I said, what is your advice in case anybody is hoping to publish a book? Go on. <laughs> and she said, be authentic oh, oh my yeah. gracious and she said Boom. diana kennedy who mm -hmm. whose most of whose books i published mm -hmm. great mexican authority british however mm -hmm. yes but and a the, friend and, and a, a friend, friend. I, know, I know where you're yes. going with this yes. even though she was british she was a friend <laughs> Even yeah, she was writing about Mexican Sandra food. is a good friend of yeah. Diana, too, um, who is widely considered a major authority on Mexican food. And Rick Bayless of television, wonderful mm -hmm. restaurants in Chicago. She said neither of them could publish their first book today. Yeah. I said, what? She said... They're not Mexican. The authentic thing is the thing. But it's also the thing wow. that Carla and Sandra and Nancy have been talking about, the authentic voice, mm -hmm. the voice of the person who's done the thing and found the thing and 
is giving it to you, really. Yes. But I would That's add another way. Um, I would add, Fran, that the publishing world, the editors, the publishers, the people buying the books, were not ready for our voices. Oh boy, were they Whoa. not? And they were not Diana's ready for our voices. Book, I was. <laughs> Now, do what? I have to pull out the day job and start asking questions? What do you mean? Okay. Okay. What, what do, do I you mean? mean they're not ready okay, for your voices? Okay, so they wanted authenticity, which yes. is a word that I'm very careful Absolutely. using because when I write about it, I always tell people, which recipe is authentic, your grandma's or your grandma's, even mm. though it's the same dish, but they're completely different. Mm -hmm. So. But what, what they were not ready for was the brown, black, Asian people writing food that we knew, well, that we grew up it. with, that it's our wow, history. Yeah. And I have to preach it, I have to say wow. it, because it took 30 years for my book, this book, to be published, because I would get to publishing houses, big publishing houses, and I would say, look, I've got 9,000 recipes here to prove that I know what Latin American food is, 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 is about. Yes. And they would say, we're only interested in Mexican food. And I would tell them, what would have happened if somebody 50, 60 years ago would have said, I'm only interested in Italian food. Absolutely. The rest is European. We don't want the rest. We would never know about French, Spanish, Portuguese, etc. What if they had said, we're only interested in Chinese food? And why didn't you give up? I I'm didn't curious. give up because I don't like to, say, to take no for an answer. Good for you. <laughs> I always think, not here, not now, not Absolutely. yet. Absolutely. But I will find a way to do it. You had a story to tell Absolutely. and you were going to tell it. No matter Absolutely. How long it and aren't we thankful she did everybody? Yes. 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 Whew, worth yes. the wait. And I think to that point, when I wanted to do my soul food cookbook, I went to my literary agent and uh, I thought that was authentic. And, um, <laughs> and I said, um, oh, this is the book that I want to do. And she was like, no, you shouldn't do that book because you have fans from all over. And I'm a tourist, by the way. And, um, mm -mm. and so I said, but would you say that to me if I wanted to do an Italian book or Greek or Chinese or Indian? Would you have said that to me? And why do you think that soul food is so limiting? Absolutely. And so she had put it into this box. And I, and I said, not only am I going to double down on it. And she knows this story, so I, I talk, tell it all the time. Um, and so not only did I double down and said, I'm going to do this this book, but I went, I wanted to buck the system. I wanted to have a certain photographer. I wanted to have a certain co-writer. I wanted, I, I, we, on the Soul Food Cookbook, when we got to Nashville and we were going from city to city, I had to relearn my food. So it's like when you went back with that, that cake. Like you're Southern, but I haven't looked at Southern food intellectually. I didn't, I didn't know yeah. what other people thought about Southern food. It's like yeah. you talking about you know, Latin food and asking different people. So I had to interview people. So the other thing is we got back to Nashville after this like five city tour and, and, you know, and all this stuff. We get to Nashville, we're like, oh my gosh, we love this place. It, it's, it's, we were gonna just download and just like start recipe testing but the light was so beautiful that we looked at the photographer who was supposed to book out of town We're like dude can you stay for four more days we decided every single summer recipe we went well I went to the farmers market oh. I would come back I would cook he would take pictures and then I had to write a recipe later Wow. Yeah. That's how authentic, yeah. that was like yes. that experience. Yeah. And trusting that it was coming from you so you could write it down as opposed to in a lab, write it up, brr, vetted. Right. So speaking of authenticity, it, it, you're, you have to trust that it's your magic. voice is the best voice regardless right. of how it comes out. But what about if the fear of rejection comes up? Did anybody face that? Oh, yes, all the time. I hit a I nerve. Mean, you get more rejection than you get acceptance. Absolutely. I mean, well, I could wallpaper my house with rejection letters. Oh. But the thing is, you have to have a thick skin and just say, Absolutely. I have something to share. I have something to say. Absolutely. I do know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And someone at some point will listen and will believe and will understand. And then they'll let me preach it because it is, I don't know, it's so limiting. And that's why, what, I, what I mean when I was saying at the beginning, writing cookbooks is not as simple as most people think. They think you have an idea, you make your recipe, you put it together in a binder and you sell it. Our stories are all different. And your story as an editor is different with all the authors you've had. Yeah. Every book has a story. And it's very difficult to get it from mine to your hands. Mm -hmm. It takes years, years of work which is why now that our books are being stolen by artificial intelligence, 
Oh, yeah. it's so upsetting. <laughs> it's a cover. Yeah. Your book's stolen. I, they have two of mine. I'm sure they have yours. They're, uh, artificial intelligence, just last month, um, we found out that they have stolen our books, literally without paying any copyright, without giving us any remuneration, to train robots no. to write in our voices. Are you serious? Yeah. I promise. I'm serious. There's going to have to be a big wow. Me Too movement here from writers to, to AI and say one moment. That, okay. Mm -hmm. that. If my grandmother was here, they'd hear it. <laughs> but I want to say to that point and any challenges that we had. So when I was on the Chew, you know, we used to have those um, those little contests, and you know, we we would like one host against the other, and we would do like a recipe. And this particular time, I was doing a recipe with Clinton Kelly, and um, so he made he got up that morning. He's like, oh, I think I'm going to do some ch cheesy. So uh, I'm going to do like broccoli and cauliflower with cheese, blah, 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 blah. And then I was like, ooh, I'm going to do my grandmother's collard greens. I'm going to do uh, hot water cornbread. Oh, my God, that's what I'm going to do. Well, I was in New Jersey, child. You know, I'm in New York. I was like, you know, they, they didn't know anything about that. And so uh, uh, it was nine to one. I think the last one voted for me because they didn't want to be a clean sweep. I was so hurt. I mean, I was really, really hurt, right? And I, I was like, oh my God, I just felt rejected. So when it came to do my uh, Carla Hall Soul Food and I came to the hot water cornbread, I, we were shooting it this particular day and I said, I have to change the recipe because I don't think that I people are going to want this recipe. And I was going to put pat a shoe in with like <laughs> something French in with, I mean, dude, uh, pat a shoe with cornmeal. I was going to change it, blah, 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 blah. And I'm literally. For the cornbread, yeah. dude. I mean, <laughs> to I was complicate so the recipe. No, <laughs> oh, I mean, oh, but I was, I, I was so You're messed about up. About to beat Fran now I, with I the know. peanut butter. <laughs> I, but, but this is what messes with your head. They drove like, her to this. I see. Yeah, it messes with your head, and it's because I had that memory still in my right. body and that rejection. rejection. And so when it came, I, even though I was doing all these other recipes, to that and and, and literally, I'm doing it, and I, I'm in the shoot. And it was like my grandmother, my grandmother came to me and said, girl, don't you change that recipe. Don't you do it. I'll get the spoon out. And so, and, and so I, I literally went back to the original recipe, but I thought about yes. it. And this is what happens. I mean, so that it, it's called imposter syndrome. It, yes, we feel it. Yes. And it's wow. And that's where teaching totally. also helps us, because mm -hmm. at the moment we're teaching, we have to remind ourselves Okay, we might not know how the moon moves around the earth or whatever, but I know this and Absolutely. I can teach it to them. In this moment, this pancake or this tortilla or this arepa or this hoe cake, or I know how to make it and I'm going to teach them. I'm the expert. That disappears when you're writing a book with so much rejection. You feel you're constantly with this imposter syndrome voice saying, you really don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. That's so sad, though. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Nancy. I do have a quick formula as far as it's like you're thinking, I want to write a cookbook. Okay. Someone told me this. I think this is brilliant because, and it doesn't mean you're not good. In, it, it's something to think about as you tighten it up. If your goal is to get a publisher to publish it for you. If you're okay. self-publishing, do whatever you want. It's all on you. You're putting the money up. You're going to deal with it. And you can do very well. Self-publishing is awesome. I was going to ask that. Yeah, is that okay? Nothing yes. wrong with self-publishing. Okay. You know, if it's, self, it's, mm -hmm. it's great. It, like, all the ways are great. Right. Agent, no agent. There's pros and cons. It's like, should I have children? Should I not? Should I have two? Should I have them close together? It's like, it's just going to be a <laughs> different story. Not good, not bad, not right, not wrong. But here's the formula. What is it? Who cares? Why you? Yeah. And what that's not it? just book publishing. But if you are trying to pitch to someone who has to be convinced. Mm. And it, people may say, well, it's a stupid idea, we're not gonna publish it. Once you get clear on that, yes. you'll say, oh, they don't get it, I'll keep going. Maybe I'm gonna self-publish, mm. maybe I'm gonna go back and tweak it a little bit more. Mm. It's not that you'll give up, but what is it? Who cares? Why you? Perfect, I perfect. And I know we're getting short on time, so I'm going to do a round robin of a question, and I just want your first response when I ask this. Of you. Look, 
Oh my goodness, it's not gonna be bad. I have to translate first from Spanish okay. to English. Translate, translate. Okay, and I'm gonna start with you. What's your favorite recipe? My grandmother's recipes, any of them. Any of them? Pick one. Okay, I'll pick one. The asopado de pollo in this book, which is a very thick soup yes. with um, arborio rice, so it's thick and creamy with lots of chicken and an annatto sofrito, which is mm -hmm. onions and tomatoes and garlic, and annatto achiote, which you've all been eating if you've ever had cheddar cheese that's orange. Yes. Because it's what gives white cheddar cheese its color orange. It's annatto achiote. Um, and then she added a little bit, the, the, the magic taste was a little bit of dried cloves. Wow. Wow. Try it, it's really amazing. That sounds delicious. You, you made me hungry 15 minutes ago. So yes, Carla. Okay, my favorite recipe, it depends on the season, but I'm gonna tell you what first came to my head and one of the ones that I, I really like in the book. Um, oh my God, even then I couldn't, I, okay, I'm gonna tell you what, ah, okay. Um, I, I know, okay, okay, one. Okay, the black eyed pea salad with hot sauce vinaigrette. Ooh. And the reason I'm choosing that is because um, the idea of it, when I think about fried catfish and the hot sauce and the mustard, and so I use the hot sauce and the mustard that I would put in the catfish, but I wanted to show black eyed peas, and I put that in the, uh, the vinaigrette, and, and that's a very quick recipe that I, that I love. It. it becomes a fan favorite. Wonderful. Ooh, love it. Nancy. Mine is my grandmother's coconut cake. Ooh, Ooh. mine too. Because my grandmother made it. Yes. And I remember it, and I remember my essay in the, in, in the Carolina table is about the family reunion, and it was, she made it twice a year. She made it at Christmas when coconuts came up from the Caribbean, oysters and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and coconut recipes have a Christmas connection because that's when they became available. Amazing. And um, it's, it's like two layers cut in half, so it's, it's thin layers, and the icing is sugar and coconut and water cooked together and so that it's almost it's an icing you can see through it you can see the cake and she my grandfather was one of the two times of year that he was in the kitchen helping he was in the kitchen eating but he opened the oysters for his famous oyster stew which was oysters i mean it's a north carolina oyster stew and he would uh crack open the and they ground it up in the meat grinder and wow. it's it's just it's very homey. It's an old time. I'm sure she didn't make it up. It's an old time North old Carolina time kind of recipe that kind of fell out of favor uh -huh. because it's not fluffy or pretty or anything. But it's wonderful, Ooh, it and I remember her making it. Wow! And your grandfather was her taste tester. That's exactly exactly. Right. He, I knew, the that. he of knew the benefits of helping out. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Fran, I think Hoppin' John skillet cornbread, Ooh. Ooh. which. You can find that. it online Ooh. anywhere. I happen to have published it back in my editing oh, days. And oh. it's, it's a wonderful recipe. You need, you need a cast iron skillet, really. I know. I happen to have one of those square ones that's made for the, that a dear friend who mm -hmm. died left me. <laughs> <laughs> that friend loved you a lot. I know. Yes. And you wow. you just fry up a few little dice of mm. bacon, mm. put it in a very hot oven without the bacon, oh. just the bacon fat. And when it is hot as wow. blazes, you have a buttermilk cornbread egg oh. batter that you plop in all mm. at once. And you cook it for, I think it's 20 minutes. It is so delicious. It's mm. really crispy on the outside. It's got that little bacon oh. taste. It's just oh. wonderful. Mm. I'm gonna mm. dream mm. about that tonight. <laughs> Dude, I'll oh. be in the same dream. Oh, oh my god. We're, we're having another talk tonight, apparently. Yes, we are, we are, yes, we are. <laughs> OK, 